<laughs> okay, friends. So hi, it's Deanna Williston with Our Blooming Catholic Life, and I'm back today with John Kramer of the Lego Church Project. But today we're going to focus more on the invisible disabilities and the church community. Yes. So how did you get involved with this? What came first, the Lego project or disability awareness? Well, in some ways, the Lego Church Project kind of opened up the doors with the issue of disability. I've always had a disability, just not one that's easily noticed. Mm -hmm. If you take a look at me in daily life, you'll see a very huge, possibly morbidly overweight guy. What they don't see, though, is the issues that are underneath it the issues with chronic balance, the issues with social interaction, they don't see that nitty gritty. Unless you were to actually truly get to know me, you wouldn't notice anything was different. Uh, other than the fact that maybe you've had a little too much caffeine, but, <laughs> but yeah, it's just, you, you run into that kind of, oh, he's not working because he's overweight. Oh, he just needs to lose weight. He just needs to do this, this, and this. You can work as a greeter. Yeah, well, it's kind of hard to uh, work in certain positions when, number one, you don't have the right kind of social interaction. Your, your social interactions are very difficult, even on a good day. Your physical issues, kind of the hand-eye coordination can be a problem. I've had that crop up in quite a few of the jobs that I've attempted to work over the years. So there's just a lot of, there's a lot of judgment that gets passed uh, on people who don't quite fit the normal definition of disability. When, when you think of, of, when you think of disability, you often think of someone who's blind, mm -hmm. someone who's in a wheelchair, someone who has obvious uh, neurological issues, or like such a cerebral palsy, uh, the more pronounced and unfortunately the more severe cases. But you don't necessarily think of someone who may have a developmental disability, or even something that just may be a little, just a little bit of enough of a quirk or a challenge to throw that person off their balance, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I've certainly run into that quite a few times in my life. Uh, sometimes the interactions are quite positive. Sometimes they're uh, a little bit less than ideal, even by well-meaning people who know you. Uh, yeah. I I've run into that uh, situation more than a few times, unfortunately. And I think this problem really is going to start coming to a head because when I mean, you have the normal, you know, the quote, normal problems that have always been with us, you have people that mm -hmm. start to go hard of hearing, you know, deaf, um, you have the blind, like you mentioned. So there's disabilities that people are aware of and people in wheelchairs, you know, that you can see, but then we have the big, that big population explosion of autism. Those mostly young men are like, in their late 20s, early 30s right now. And a lot of them have done a lot of great therapy and things to make them appear, you know, quote, fit in more with society. So that's a huge population that's out there that we have to accommodate. But like you said, nobody can see that. No, and I think one of the other things too is that, at least from my, I'm speaking strictly from my own understanding, mm -hmm. I have had to learn how to adapt a little bit. I've had to learn how to, uh, basically pinch it when things come up to learn how to navigate that minefield that's created. Uh, in certain situations, uh, my brain likes to go into overload and shut down. Mm -hmm. Think of it like a circuit breaker that's uh, pop, that's tripping. Instead of having one, you have all of them trip at once. Right. So you have to learn how to navigate through that. Uh, and a one-size-fits-all policy doesn't work because we all have our own ways of handling things. We all have our own ways of trying to navigate around that. Uh, growing up, I did for a while drive. Uh, I don't anymore for various reasons, but uh, I had to learn how to work with the hand and the eyes to try and get those together a little bit better. Uh, so I didn't crack the car, <laughs> which was a challenge sometimes, especially Especially trying to drive through Detroit, which I've done yeah. a few times. Yeah, that uh, I can't even imagine that. <laughs> Detroit, I, I don't know how it is in other parts of the country, but Detroit driving is a lesson in patience. <laughs> Especially when you're an outpatient person. I mean, I don't even drive. I, I do have my driver's permit right now, but I haven't driven since I was like 20. And for me, I got used to the community of the bus 
and I just, I do prefer that. And, you know, I prefer putting off my chores. I do them like once or twice a week, go out and do them in a batch. And I'm with my friends the whole time before and after. And oftentimes during, you know, you might get off at the store with a bunch of people and kind of hang out with them. Especially as you know, you might have to wait for the bus to come back so we could sit and have a sandwich or something while we wait. And so the prospect of starting to drive again just seems so lonely to me. But my my bus stop got canceled, so there's, there's not a lot of options there. Well, see, for me, one of the things I love doing when I was driving is if it was especially was just with me. Number one, I'm an amateur radio operator. I've had my license since 2003, and no interesting story on that later. But uh, the challenge was is I always use the time to pray. Mm. When I was just by myself, if I wasn't jabber on the radio with someone uh, within the county, I was praying. So, and that's one of the things I miss about it, because I used to take these long trips between uh, Saginaw and Flushing, which is about 40 minutes. Beautiful time to pray. Beautiful time just to sit and converse with God about what's going on in your life, your troubles, your worries, and your fears. And the transportation is another major issue that we run into. Uh, if you don't have the right kind of contacts, that can be a problem. Mm -hmm. I've talked to several people that I know over the years who have always had that problem with, uh, if they didn't have their friends, they wouldn't be able to get to the store. Yeah. And, and the worst part about it is, is, especially with the invisible disabilities, a lot of the current services are more, are more tailored to the people with more extreme issues. Mm -hmm. There's very, very few, if any, services that are geared towards those with more mild cases that are mostly independent but they need a little bit of help here and there. Not a lot of those services. And this has been the way it's, this is not a new occurrence. This has always been a major issue. I do think least, that, that might have come partially because, you know, people used to live in the giant group homes and things. And when they went to community living, then they had to provide those services in the community. And that became the priority. I do wonder if in the past those minor disabilities did have more services before that. I'm wondering about that. I'd have to do a little more research myself. I, I simply don't have an answer for that. Yeah. But it would definitely be interesting to, to see. Mm -hmm. I know that there, that there was a lot of uh, a major push over the years. But then again, some of the major cities have their own transportation systems. Right. Uh, but during the pandemic, at least here in Saginaw County, we lost our main bus service. Yeah. Our bus service was shut down for several months, and that hurt a lot of people. Yep. Uh, especially when they, they did have the, the ride share services, but those cost money, and a lot of people are on fixed incomes. <laughs> yeah, we, di we didn't even have any of those. There's none operating our little area. And, and at first, people, you know, Uber, there was an Uber driver, but he, he disappeared for the same reason all the taxi drivers disappear. There's just... They feel like there's not enough, but they're not advertising. They're not reaching the right people. And I think that happens with everyone. You know, you'll know that one person who has a similar disability to you and everything seems to align for them and they get all these services. But oftentimes that doesn't translate into you getting the same thing or it just doesn't work out or they don't share it. So you've, you've got a disparity of services. Yeah. And you run into that all the time. Uh, I, I certainly have experienced it where I've been trying to find services over the years. Uh, it can be a challenge. Uh, you have some people who have more, the, the, the more severity of your disability and your, and your issues, the easier it can be to get the right kind of services. For, for people like me who are extremely high functioning, mm -hmm. mostly independent, it can be a challenge. Yeah. Uh, and, and even for just for basic things, like trying to get to church and stuff, if I didn't have my friends uh, who are willing to give me a ride, I wouldn't be able to get to church. Yeah, in, um, in our city, that's in our county, oh, they have buses, their buses run on Sunday. Our buses don't run on Sunday down here, so you can't get to services. Yeah, our buses don't, our buses don't run. I don't think the buses in Saginaw run on Saturday anymore. They used to. Yeah, but even then, they, this bus service stops at 6 o'clock. So if you get a 5.30 mass uh, then on uh, Saturday, then you don't have an easy way home unless you know someone within the parish. Right, yeah, ours I'm, stopped at 5. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, and I've been really blessed on that because I've been able to forge the connections. But forging the connections alone is a challenge and a half, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you don't like to necessarily interact 
with people, and it's not so much because you're afraid of asking for help. The uh, Going back to a recent tweet of mine that I wrote, uh, which I'm going to actually read in its entirety here, huh. is the greatest issue that I face at times is not willing to ask for help, but rather it's asking for help and getting silence as the answer. Mm. That is always the great problem. It is not even someone saying, no, I can't do this. I'm sorry. It's right. the crickets that you hear. Worse, when I'm sure you've had this. I've had this when they just walk away. It's not even silent. Yeah. Turn their back and walk away. And it's like, well, that's silence I, itself. I just need something. Like, give me something, you know? Because <laughs> people, a lot of them, I know, like, with, with just the simple not driving or not being able, sometimes you can't use transportation because, like you said, there's somebody in the group that has maybe a, a germ phobia or some social issues. So they want to, they don't want to get on that giant school bus to go to the church retreat or whatever. They want to ride like with one of the moms who's going in her own SUV. Yeah. Well, but sometimes just asking that is so difficult. Like if you already have social challenges, it probably takes a lot for you to ask and, and not, it's not a humility or pride issue. It's because of a social. It's because of the social, but it's also because once again, you get told when you get nothing but silence, yeah. that can become an issue where you get really discouraged. And it's not a matter of pride. It's not a matter of vanity. It's just you're afraid to ask because you know what the answer will probably be. And unfortunately, the answer, silence is worse than being told no. Yeah. Because silence is worse than being told no. I don't mind it when a friend of mine tells me that they can't do something and that they tell me why they can't do it. Right. Uh, in one particular case, uh, my one friend is very busy. She has a very busy life and I understand that. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the fact that she actually gave me a solid answer. It may not have been the, uh, a favorable one to tell my situation, but still, I now know why she is unable to do something. And I appreciate and I respect her for that. Right. I can't hold that against, uh, against that person. Whereas you ask someone and they just won't respond at all. Yeah. That can be discouraging. That can be heartbreaking because it feels like you're being ignored. Right. Especially and when you said that earlier though. You said people don't they judge you unless they get to know you. And that's it right there. Because if they stop and answer you, that is relationship building. Yeah. And when they turn and walk away, even if they have been a friend, it's it does put a, a damper on that relationship. So you have to make yourself it's I don't even think humility is the right thing. It's very vulnerable sometimes to ask people. And that's an opportunity if you're out there, if you ever get asked <laughs> to help people, especially someone with a disability, they're making themselves vulnerable when they ask you. And so to respect the dignity of the person, to stop and have a conversation with them. And no, maybe you can't do it all the time. You know, you're in a hurry or something and, yeah. and you just give a quick answer, but revisit it because... I think it does really speak to the dignity of the person. So often they're they're like, oh, it's just a favor they're asking. But you made yourself vulnerable and you're trying to communicate something, a need. And it's not just going to be that one-time need, probably. It's probably going to come back up. Yeah. But they take the time to sit and talk. What's going on? Why do you need this help? It, it, maybe they can help you brainstorm other solutions, but it, it builds a relationship. Yeah, and there's always a challenge with that, especially with some people... Some people have trust issues. Yeah. They, they, they have a really hard time. And it's not necessarily a fault of their own. It's just the quirk of their nature where, where they have a hard time opening themselves up because their fear, there's a certain fear of rejection in that. Yes. Yeah. And, and rejection not being uh, the someone saying no to something, but rather just that total... Um, ignoring that entire situation you're fighting with. Right. I run into that, to that problem all the time with the project. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've run into that kind of frustration where uh, I put out appeals to say, hey, I want to do this display. Can I get some help? Crickets. The, you, you get discouraged. And, and the problem is you got to be very careful because you can let that discouragement mm -hmm. fester into a very negative attitude. I've certainly had to be very careful when that kind of stuff happens. And I try, strong word on that, uh, try not to let it uh, derail me emotionally. Because if I do, right. 
then I start getting bitter and I start getting grumbly. And then I kind of lose track of what it is that I'm trying to do. Right. Yeah. And, and oftentimes I, I do think sometimes it's, it's in us asking, like I may have a lot of needs or I'm just using me as an example, but of course mm -hmm. it's not, not just me. But when you put yourself out there and you ask people and you don't get any answers, then sometimes it's on us that we have to rethink how we're asking. Maybe we need to spend more time building those relationships and letting people get to know us. And that's completely being vulnerable. But the other things may come once we have that relationship and that community built more. And it and it sucks because you're already sitting there with a disability of some sort, you know, something. It's not necessarily even a, a disability. Sometimes it can be a disadvantage, like you can't afford a car or something. You know what I mean? It can be that as well. But you have to, sometimes it falls on your shoulders. It's not fair, but mm -hmm. it falls on your shoulder to build that, be that community builder. Well, establishing connections can be a challenge, especially mm -hmm. since it is a matter of, at least for me, through prayer, wisdom, and understanding what's going on around and trying to reach out to the right people. I mean, I, I mean, back in the day when uh, I still drove limitedly, I knew that my vehicle at the time was going to be on borrowed time. I was going to be able to, it's going to get a repair and I was not going to be able to afford it. And then after that, I was not going to be able to drive. Yeah. But I had made the effort early on to establish as many contacts as I could for both the amateur radio stuff that I was involved in and still am. Uh, and the church. Those were the two main things I was trying to work on. I figured everything else would fall into place, but I, by the time the van finally did croak out, rather spectacularly, I might add, uh, I, had, I had those things already set in place, so when it did happen, it wasn't much of a transition. There was not a lot of fear, anxiety, or whatnot. Uh, I'm currently in another state of transition right now that I've been praying about uh, a lot. Uh, the nature of chore providers and some people do have those. They have, they have tour providers, people who come in mm -hmm. and to offer to various degrees of services. Some on a little bit on the light end, with just a little bit of light housekeeping, maybe mm -hmm. take you up to the store here and there, uh, to more uh, extreme and severe cases where, you, where a person may need help uh, getting bathed, getting dressed, stuff like that. The services are there, but the problem is they're more skewed going back to an earlier discussion, they're more skewed to the more uh, severely disabled. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's maybe not necessarily even the right kind of terminology to use, but right. someone whose challenges may be greater than what they realize. Mm -hmm. So for, for people like me, that can be a challenge because it's like the main thing right now is just being able to get to the store and back. Mm -hmm. So that way I can take care of get my stuff taken care of occasionally run up to uh, the drugstore. Uh, and if the Michigan weather keeps getting weird again, like it has been, uh, sometimes I can take, sometimes I can, I mean, I'm fortunate enough that I can still ride a pedal trike. Yeah. Uh, I can't walk where the darn, but I can still ride a pedal trike and I can still get up to the drugstore if I need to for a quick run. But uh, Michigan weather has been unpredictable lately. Yeah. You don't want to get caught out in the bike in a thunderstorm. <laughs> Yeah, that would not be fun. I've, I've, I've been caught a couple times in a rainstorm. I think one year I went out somewhere in a snowstorm, light oh. snowstorm. Just started snowing. Typical Michigan weather. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh. So you have the Lego project and that does, it does allow you to discuss this with people. So if people come up and they, and they ask you, or how do you approach that? How do you have that conversation? <sighs> to be fair and honest. Uh, I ran into a situation the other day where I saw a family with a uh, nine-year-old son who clearly to me had cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. And I, I struck up a conversation with them because I understand it. Mm -hmm. I understand that, that he's probably going to be very uh, sensitive to touch. He's probably not going to like to be touched in certain, uh, like his arm and stuff. He's going to be very sensitive to that. That's going to like send, like, like send all kinds of nerve signals to him. Mm. Uh, he's also probably gonna be very sensitive to types of sounds, which I am as well. Uh, I understand that. And the look on, on the mother's face 
just kind of want this, oh no, he's going to complain about it. I said, oh, he understands it. He gets it. Mm -hmm. He understands that what I'm going through. Yeah. I understand it because I live it. Right. <laughs> and, and you and from the advantage that I have is because of the nature of my own disabilities, I understand that we all have our own struggles. We all have our own mm -hmm. challenges. And I'd like to use the project as a way to kind of break the ice a little bit. Uh, to kind of bring into more of this discussion about what's going on. Uh, I think one of the greater challenges that we have is that the invisible disabilities are often overlooked. Because, but I think that's just due to a lack of understanding on the part of society in general. Autism is becoming more and more prominent of an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, I've people. Some people have thought that I have certain traits with that, and I would not disagree with them on that. And with the cerebral palsy, a lot of that kind of stuff can go hand in hand with each other. Okay. A lot of the developed disability issues can also can translate into multiple different areas, right. even if it's not necessarily officially diagnosed. Right. Uh, and they keep changing the definitions. That yeah, help. everything is constantly changing. Uh, <laughs> but but the core core understanding has remained relatively the same. But you're starting to see more and more of that. You're starting to see a, a person. A, a person who may be having an emotional breakdown uh, that doesn't, ne doesn't necessarily seem age appropriate, right. that may just be due to the issues of the disability that they have. I know that I've been in certain situations where my brain gets overloaded. Mm -hmm. not, and, my, and the reactions that I have are not voluntary on my part. Right. This, is, this is not my decision. This is not something I want to try and uh, do and I've had to force myself more than a few times to try and maintain composure, even though my body is screaming at me at that point. Ugh. And it is, um, it's, it's a very unpleasant feeling when you're fighting yourself. Yeah. Very, um, very unpleasant. Uh, especially since you have the logic, you have the understanding that, that your body is doing something that you don't want it to do at the worst opportune time. <laughs> I, I've had to try and rein myself in more than once, and it is it's a struggle. Because you know, I'm, I'm really getting the, the metaphor of this, because we're talking of this in the church context as well. Mm -hmm. The church is full of people who are sinners. They all have invisible disabilities. Nobody knows what anyone's thing is. You know how everybody's saying like, "Oh, this triggers me. That triggers me." Well, it does because we all have these invisible disabilities. So you'd think either it would translate that knowing that if you're self-aware you would be more open to people with the more physical developmental disabilities or vice versa but so we all have a understanding of this in our own way so i guess i'm saying like we're we're coming back to church i was talking with somebody today trying to discern which mass had the least attendance so that somebody <laughs> on the autism spectrum could go um, because well, you know, like if you sit in one place, you need your space and then somebody makes you move over and you lose all your personal space. That's not good. But it sounds like most of the way what we're saying is relationship, relationship, relationship. Well, I think part of the problem that we have too in it, and I've run into this across multiple spectrums of Catholics, is you have this mentality, well, I'm coming to church for Christ, not the community. And yet, when you look at the early church history, they were a community. That was their strong uh, purpose. Paul's letters were written to communities, not just to one person. Yeah. He wrote it to everyone. So maybe my thinking is a little uh, squirrely, no, but, but... I think just, it's one extreme or the other. Or you get the people yeah. who are really coming for the community and not for Christ. Uh, I've run into I've run into that mentality too, where where you have people who are more culturally Catholic uh, that that just attend because of the fact that's what they know. Uh, they want they want coffee and donuts right away afterwards. Right? They want to sit and jabber jaw. They they may believe in Christ to some degree, but it's they they don't live it the same way as someone who firmly believes in it. Right. Uh, they're they're the ones. There, it's a it's a mess sometimes. Right, and it's it, kind of how do we meet in the middle and interact? Because you end up going with the people who are like you. You're either with the crowd that's there completely for Christ, or you're w completely with the community crowd, and we're not really mingling. 
that's completely happening at my, my church is in transition right now. Um, we had an order of priests there and they left and the diocese gave us the ordinary of the chair of St. Peter, if you're familiar at all with them. And so that's a culture shock. I will say, okay, I'll, I'll say who we had before we had the Marinus uh -huh. and now we have the, the, the ordinary of the chair of St. Peter. They are not similar. <laughs> 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 um and so there are people who are really uh, some that are clinging to the old way and some that are like hooray a new you know and and i think we're kind of separating out again whereas one group used to feel they were in the minority now they feel they're in the majority you know what i mean and and how are we going to come now that we're all coming back together for realsies mm -hmm. how are we going to get along <laughs> you, you know the, the I know, I know the charismatic renewal catches a lot of flack uh, because their their style is very unique. But one of the things that that I learned from the uh, the Mount Zion group, in particular in Flushing, there's there's a small charismatic group called the uh, called the Mount Zion community. Okay. And I've been involved with them off and on uh, since uh, the uh, late '90s, early 2000s. In fact, they were the reason why. Uh, I was able to go to World Youth Day back in 2002. Oh, wow. Uh, my parents are still involved in the community. One of the things that, that I learned early on from them was that sense of community. Mm -hmm. The fact is that we knew who each other, who we were. We knew who our neighbor was. When, when something major was going on, mm -hmm. we were there for each other. Wow, yeah. We were there. I remember when we moved from Saginaw to Flushing, there had been a bad snowstorm the day before. Mm -hmm. We show up thinking we're going to have to try and plow this long driveway out. Community members showed up. They helped us move in. Yeah, see, you, that, that's a community. They knew before you even asked. Yeah, they were there. They helped us move in. We probably, we unloaded a large house between two cities mm -hmm. within a day. Wow. Uh and that was, the one, that was the other thing. It's like we had community meals together. Uh, back, in the, back in the height of the community days, there was that, that love that we had where we spent time in fellowship. And that's something that we really don't do in the mainstream church anymore. We don't have that meal time. We don't get to know each other. We don't yeah, take that, the time. That meal time, like you say, is so important. And right now we're stuck in this stupid pandemic and... <sighs> like that's not a thing anymore and you can't even do a proper potluck we're, we're planning yeah. an event soon and it's got to be grab and go food but we're going to use the courtyard so it's going to be grab and go at a, a long table so like like you would have for the potluck just already individually portioned yeah but i think as things start to get back to normal yeah. i think i think one of the things that that we as a church need to reevaluate is is are we islands to ourselves or should we be more community minded? Yeah. I think I think the, the the best churches that we take part in are the ones that tend to have that spirit of community. Yeah. You're always going to have that one person or two people that come in and they're going to be reserved in their faith. They're going to be they they really are not going to be open to the idea of community and but you gotta take someone where they're at. You can't just yeah. pass a sweeping judgment on them and you see someone show up. I've gotten into this kind of discussion about what it means to take someone where they're at. And I believe that the core belief is, and it goes back to that disability issue where we don't pass judgment. We don't assume right. anything about that person. Uh, we don't know where their level of faith is at. We don't know what sins they may be fighting with, what church teaching they may be struggling with. There are some conflicts between ourselves and God, and that's something we got to work through on our own terms. We can't have someone blankingly tell us, "Oh, you're not Catholic enough because you don't believe this, this, and this." Yeah. The, and then, then again, you got some people who are who publicly defy church teaching, and it brings about a certain level of frustration because we want we want everyone to come to church with the right kind of mindset right. that we are here for Christ. And that we're on board with the teachings of the church. And it, the church teachings were never meant to be easy. We all have our moments where we struggle and question. Oh, <laughs> Technology yeah. is wonderful. Yeah, and, and 
Yeah, it's been Twitter that's been going off this whole time. And I know you're on Catholic Twitter too. So like some of the posts from this week that have been a firestorm. Um, the one oh. woman who said she was on vacation and her 14 year old son was in front and they went up for communion. And I saw that. Obviously the priest was racist because he asked the boy if he'd had his first communion. I was like, how did you get that jump? Did you talk to the priest? Did you say when anything the, to anybody in the parish? Like, I feel bad for the priest in that situation because, yeah, and you had people on both sides of the fence just radically jumping down either side. Right. They got into their battle lines, and you know what? A priest may not have, may not know, and it's better to ask or. Right. I, I don't know. I, I think there there should have been a little bit more questioning, but. I'm not the one that's gonna that was in that situation, so I don't know. I was not an eyewitness to that. So no. because so there's always yeah. there's always gonna be some kind of situation uh where you're not gonna fully know the full story. You only have yep. right now one side. Yeah. The the priests on Twitter constantly are getting savagely. They, they into. are. So, I mean uh, it's so extreme and but like you say, and that priest, we don't know. He could be racist, but he could be the kindest person in the world, so in love with Jesus that he just he, wanted to be sure. Like, yeah, exactly. We don't know. And how can you throw out that judgment instead of going and saying, hey, you know, th this hurt my son's feelings. Can we talk about it? When, it, when in doubt, the priest ask. out for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> you know? when, it, when in doubt, ask. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, uh, Sorry, I had another crazy one that happened this week, and, I, and I, it's failing me now. But very quick judgments like that, and they just explode. But then you see some little – somebody will make just the right comment that kind of cracks it. And people are like, oh, <laughs> I never thought of it that way. And they stop. Oh, like, 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 my, like my comment about uh, the weaponizing of the Eucharist. <laughs> I, I posted something about that the other day. It's like, I don't like to try and wade into these heavy yeah. debates. My, my ministry is more about focusing on the issues that are important to me, such as the issue of disability and bringing awareness, especially when it comes to the issues of, dis, of invisible disabilities. Uh, but at the same time, sometimes you just have to make a comment. And yeah. uh, I got a lot of uh, positive traction for the fact that my feeling is that those who are trying to weaponize the Eucharist are often the ones who want the church to change to their views versus them changing their views to the church. Which, which is exactly what we're saying. Basically, yeah. they have a disability and they want us to, <laughs> they want us to bend over backwards, but they, they, yeah. don't want, they don't want to make any effort or get any better. Just change everything for me now. But their disability isn't one, like a medical one that you can't do anything about. They could, but they choose not to. That some people want the church to change with the seasons instead of the church remaining firm even against the storms. But Because that's almost like, though, and, and this happens in the disability world, absolutely. So I'm going to use this metaphor. When you have a parent or loved one who denies that the disability exists. And, I, have, I've, I can go one further. Oh, I've, yeah. I, I can go one further. I know. I've heard very rarely some people who will say you're using your disability as a crutch, mm -hmm. as an excuse for your actions. What in the heck? Right. I, I'm sorry. I, I, that's it. It takes a lot for me to get red hot. It, it's not you're, like you're a psychopath and you're committing murder, and it's not your fault. Like yeah, like you have a disability. I, I saw someone. I saw someone in a debate once go after someone who had a disability and that person said you're using stop using your disability as a as a crutch it's like okay that is like blatant ableism in my opinion and you see a lot of that you see a lot of that broad assumption yeah uh and those people exist don't get me wrong there is the rare person yeah who does that, but it doesn't but it, happen as often as people think no uh, and normally honestly the people i've run into like that um most of us would not consider what they have to be a true disability but i don't know that they're taking advantage of it sometimes they're like a fully able-bodied person they get an injury and mm -hmm. they kind of wallow in it and people offer them things and they get used to that 
And it's hard to pull yourself out of that when everybody's doing everything for you. You know what I mean? I'm not talking, uh, I know that's probably walking a fine line there, but that does happen sometimes. And that's well, an easy trap to fall into. But I think that that's more rare than anything. I think the issue, and I speak strictly for myself and my own yeah. uh, perceptions on things. As someone who has got a mouth from a cerebral palsy, I want to be treated fairly. Mm-hmm. Uh, the challenges that I face often throw me off for a loop a little bit here and there. Right. Uh, but if it was, this is the, this is the path that God has placed me on, whether, no matter how I feel about it. And in that understanding is when I was growing up, it took me a long time to become comfortable with who I am. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be married, have multiple kids. I wanted to have the well-paying job. Uh, so, so there was that desire to follow a path that most people would consider normal. I certainly don't live a normal life, but by the grace of God, I'm still standing. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I've been very blessed with being able to share with people the importance of humility and understanding that some people have challenges that we may not even realize. Right. Uh, I often use my motto, uh, for for my my personal mission statement where I mentioned challenges or disabilities. One of the things about that is that some people, some people may have challenges in their life, but they may not necessarily see it as an outright disability. Whereas someone who lives in that disability mindset may recognize it. And, And sometimes acceptance, the, the issue of acceptance is not always from, others it's from within our own self to accept the fact that this is the cross this is the challenge that we have to face with and some people accept it as a disability some people may not uh and we can't judge someone for that we really can't uh i'm just saying though but it's it's almost like with the eucharist issue there's people saying you have to change the rules there's nothing wrong with me they can't see that they do have something wrong with them that maybe they aren't approaching the Eucharist, you know, reverently. It, I'm thinking of the, the congressmen or the people who went out and demanded, they said they had a, a right to the Eucharist. The same people who put us on quarantine, right, and locked up our churches are saying they have a right to the Eucharist now. And it's well, like, oh. and I think part of, I think part <laughs> of it, some people see the Eucharist as a trophy. Yeah, exactly. It's like a participation award. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and when in reality, it is the most humbling thing that it, it should be, always be the most important part of the Catholic faith. Right. And I think part of the problem is that we really have moved away from that teaching a little bit. Yeah. Uh, whether that's because of someone's views that run counter to the church or it's just because they've gotten lapsed, lax in their faith. Right. Uh, I certainly know it to be true. I, I have spent many times uh, in the chapel just in prayer not so much for everyone else going on around me, but rather for within my own self, Mm -hmm. uh, for the things that I struggle with. And I have found great peace in that. I I really have. I I have found for me that prayer can be the most rewarding thing that I can take part in uh, because it sometimes gives me a better insight to what's going on. Uh, certainly not I'm always uh, magical answers, but at the same time, it can clear the, the confusion within my own mind, uh, especially when I'm taking on uh, different challenges, like trying to find a new provider, mm-hmm. uh, which I've been doing for the last uh, last week or so. But I, I've got confidence that the word's going to guide. Uh, I truly do. Uh, not, and not just with these issues, but throughout my life. Yeah, when- I really... I really see that humility in you. And for me, part of it comes from having been locked out of the churches and then having this discussion about is the Eucharist right? Because um, by the time this airs, my Friday show will have already aired where, you know, I'm talking about that. And I realize like none of us have a right to the Eucharist. None of us are really worthy. And yet God gave it to us anyway. And that does... That's something that comes to you in prayer, but that humility, it like you said, it's kind of freeing. You don't deserve it, but you know that God's going to provide it anyway. And the Eucharist, partly, is that sign for us. It's okay. I We're never going to be worthy. We do our best. We go to confession. We get clean, all that. You know, you do all everything that you can do, whether it's for a disability, 
or your, your spiritual life, you're never going to be worthy in that regard, but it doesn't matter because God loves you anyway. You do it and, and that's the great love. Well, I think part of the, part of the challenge that we have, especially when it comes to this debate is there are people out there that not only are they publicly embracing sin, mm -hmm. they're making a very big deal that they're publicly embracing sin and they're unrepentant. Yeah. And then they're coming up for for commute for uh, coming up in line for communion. That is one of the most, to me, personally speaking, it is not so much what their beliefs are, right. but the sins that they are embracing. It's the fact that they are unrepentant on it. Yes. If you have if you have a repentant sinner coming before the cross, begging for God's mercy because they know they've done something wrong. Yeah. Especially in this time where confession is not always easy to obtain. We were locked out of it for so long, right. and it's not fully back yet. I, I would like to believe that God is understanding in the fact that, that he judges your heart. Yeah. Are you repentant? Do you truly repent? Yes. But at the same time, you've got these individuals very publicly saying, well, it doesn't matter what the church teaches. This is what I believe. That's what matters to me. I'm still going to come up and receive. Right that creates a frustration because you've got these Catholics who truly believe and truly uphold the teachings and they feel like they're being looked down on for that belief when you've got these other people getting a free pass. Yeah. So and I, it's a I'm, challenge. I am really encouraged that the bishops, they're not coming out, you know, they can't just come out and do some grand, great excommunication of a political party. That's not what's happening. They're going the aspect of love and not just it's not the accompaniment that we hear about so often necessarily. It's they're gonna they're writing us a love letter from God. Yeah. They're they're teaching us how much God loves us in the Eucharist. So I, I am hopeful that this year the Eucharist, I don't know if that's uh countrywide, but I know here in the Archdiocese of Baltimore they've they've claimed it as year of the Eucharist. And we're, we're gonna spend time focusing on that and teaching on that to see if if we can get that understanding out there but that's exactly what we're talking about right we're building relationship in community now whether we're building it with god <laughs> or with our fellow man it it works no matter what you say because our god is a god of relationship unlike those other religions right yeah our god wants a relationship with us and i guess it's what it comes down to there that's the model for it and that's kind of your work with disability awareness and the lego church project you're building that relationship, community, helping people. You're breaking the ice, like you said, helping start that conversation. I think it's a conversation that we need to have. I think that that for far too long, the reason, there's a reason why we call it invisible, invisible disabilities, not just because they're not easily seen, but because people tend to overlook them. Yeah. And it is a, and it is a challenge because it feels like we're being minimized. Right. Uh, you... When, when people think of disabilities, they think of it as certain as certain situations. They may not necessarily realize that that person, that another person may have a developmental disability, which right. can, I, I know I speak from 100% personal experience on this. There are days when, when, when my challenges throw me for a loop. <laughs> and and there's, I, I remember that other Twitter comment that was going on. Um, it was the young mom debate. You want young families at church, absolutely. But you've got people with sensory hypersensitivity. You've got people with hearing issues. And you've got a baby screaming right behind them. So if you're already a sensory overload person, you're gone. If you've got hearing problems, you can't hear a word that's being said. And yet you love that baby, but maybe not where they're sitting. Well, uh, but I think, that, I think that accommodations can be made. Uh, yeah. A lot. A lot of parishes have cry areas, or you can also relocate to the vestibule if you need to. I, I've on a couple of the displays that I've had that I've done. Uh, excuse me first. Oh, there we go. Uh, there have been a there have been a couple situations where I've seen families come out to the vestibule just to get away from the noise a little bit. Right. Uh, <laughs> apparently, guys decided to bless us with some uh, rain. Oh, oh, good, good. I don't know. I don't don't know how much how much the microphone's picking up. Yeah, but. I don't know, and we're we're running out of time. But I will say, like for this specific issue, my church had an issue, and hopefully they're starting to talk about it. They put chairs in the back, loose chairs behind the pews, 
so that parents of small children could sit there but get up quickly if they needed to. What happened was people with physical disabilities, like bad knees and things that don't like the long pews, started sitting in them. Woo, that blew up. <laughs> well, but you, you can know, see both sides. Again, there, there's no reason. Forward. There's no reason. There's it's no reason. it shouldn't be an issue. If if there are chairs yeah. placed out there, yeah. I mean, I think that's a fair accommodation for both groups. Right. But somebody put a sign on it that it belonged to the one group. That's where it got ugly. That, yeah, that's <laughs> see, that's not right. That no. we want to be as welcoming as we can. Yeah. Uh, you never know how we're going to evangelize to the stranger. And, and what it really says to me is, okay, put up another section. We have like four sections of pews. Just put out <laughs> another row behind there. I know me, like I have two, I have a kidney disease and Crohn's disease. When I sit at the end of the pew, it's because I'm getting up. It, <laughs> I may need to walk over you. I don't think in my life I've ever made it through an entire mass. You know, I'm almost always earning out. And so please, those those single chairs are like a godsend for someone like me and you can't see that looking at me yeah of but, course the same with same way of me if yeah. someone was to look at me they'd see as i said they see this giant fellow uh but at the same time they don't realize that my panel's is shot yeah uh i can ride my trike but at right. the same time i can't walk very well because my knees are in bad shape because i've fallen too many times yeah there there's always that hidden damage so to speak the it hidden is. challenges yeah. And it can be a struggle. It can be a struggle to be accepted. Yeah. Uh, and going back to that theme of the greatest challenges that sometimes we face is not asking for help. It's the fact that there's often times that silence that comes with it. Yeah. And that can be more heartbreaking than anything else. Uh, if you want to be uplifting, acknowledge the person, even if it's even if it's a no answer, at least they now. They're not left guessing. They're not left in limbo, so to speak. Right. Uh, and that's what my one friend did for me. Uh, I had asked her a very important question, very important favor. I knew there was a good chance that she wasn't going to be able to do it. I understood that. Yeah. But she had the decency to say, I'm sorry, I can't. And it, it is decency. It is the dignity of the human person. That's what we're talking about. Our brothers and sisters in Christ. Just stop and have the conversation. Absolutely. So I guess I guess that's where we'll end it here. Um, yeah. So you never know what struggles somebody's going through, whether it's spiritual, physical, mental. You just don't know because we didn't even get into mental illnesses. It could be anything. Yeah. So just stop and talk to them. Now, you know, we will say there's people with autism who may not be the best conversationalists, but that doesn't mean you don't make some effort and ask them. Say, what are your boundaries? Am I standing too close? If you see they yeah. look uncomfortable ask them don't be afraid to ask let's have the hard conversations so that we can be truly the body of christ amen to that okay well thank you very much thank um you I, for look forward, I look this was a great discussion i really look forward to getting this up 